Mark chapter 14. And being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. Now understand something here. They didn't have bank accounts and all that kind of stuff like, like we do. They had possessions that had value. That's what they had. So this, this was probably her everything. Are you hearing me? Like some of you, some of you were standing next to your everything. Come on, men. Come on. <laughs> well, at least that's what you told her. <laughs> And she broke the box and poured it on his head. Here he is in a dinner setting and almost as an intruder, her worship out of place for the setting. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? Some people don't understand worship. And sadly today, some people don't pull over when a funeral possession is going by. Do we no longer revere life like we should? Are you hearing me? Some people don't honor the, 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 those, those public servant vehicles when their light's on and so Pull over. They're going to probably save somebody's life just because it's not yours right now. Revere that. Does that make sense? So she shows up. And they have indignation towards her worship and reverence to God. And they, they try to put a dollar amount on it. I'm going to tell you something. You start living for God and put a dollar amount on everything, you've already lost. I'm not saying you are lost, but I'm saying you're losing. For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. Forgive me, but I doubt that that would be their intentions, but Okay. And they murmured against her. Don't let anybody murmur. Don't worry about anybody's murmuring against your worship. Are you hearing me? And Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always. And whatsoever ye, ye may do them good, but me you have not always. You have a very short time to do for God what you're going to do. I know life may seem long to you teenagers because you got so many things you want to do, but you're going to blink and be old and hopefully gray-headed instead of bald-headed and realize that there's more time behind you than in front of you. It says she hath done what she could. Oh, God, that that would be said for my life. Have I done what I could? Not what, not the bare minimums to get by. Have I done what God has given me that I can do? She has come aforehand, listen to this, to anoint my body to the bearing. She is giving the full measure for his last full measure. Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Let's place our Bibles down. No person was ever honored for what they collected or received. Honor has been the reward for those that gave. Jesus, we love you. We need you. God, I, I, I believe that I'm, I'm speaking and preaching some, some heroes here today, some people that are on the threshold of stepping beyond themselves to, in these last days, give that last full measure and give themselves like never before to the greatest cause ever handed to mankind. I, I pray for an anointing and impartation to allow me, God, to bring forth this word under your unction and anointing in Jesus' name. And everybody say, in Jesus' name. God bless you. You can be seated. In President Abraham Lincoln's 
famous Gettysburg Address, he stated, speaking upon sacrifices given for the integrity of our freedoms for all, it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. Are you hearing me? That we were highly resolved that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thank God. Thank God. I, I pray that there is still within us a compelling to give that last full measure for the cause of Christ. I pray that there are some here still that are not willing or satisfied to play on the sidelines of mediocrity and willing to say, God, put me in the field of battle. It is still a very poignant moment that ushers the feeling of honor and nobility when I hear the first notes of taps played in honor of the fallen. The fallen service men and women garner and stir emotions within me because they have given. History is only understood looking back. Even if we don't know their story, we know they signed up. We know they took the risk for the chance to serve. And we stand in reverence because we recognize that they're risking giving all. We've all heard it said, all gave some, but some gave all. And there's just honor that is only afforded those that gave all. It points us to the sincerity of thought that there is a difference between those that gave and those that sacrifice. In a humor, uh, more humorous note, we've all heard or seen it on YouTube or an event, that marriage proposal. <laughs> the kiss cam captures the moment, or maybe at a family event, that display of affection where someone commits to give all. Catches your attention. It's... It's no small step. It's the giving of oneself. In our, man, in our mind, sadly, we've kind of been trained to equate the public display to mean a more seriousness of the act. If it's done for everybody to see. In fact, if, if a guy drops down to one knee in front of a crowd, that stops. There's something magical about knowing that you're loved beyond limits. Something magical about that relationship that, that causes someone to feel love. Jeremiah 31 and 3, the Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. That everlasting, that, that, that verb, especially with the prepositional prefix that means always. Wow. There's something about knowing that you've been loved when you've been unlovable. Think about that for a moment. We're not always good, but he always loves. We're not always right, but he always loves. We're not always loving, 
but he always loves. God has an unbreakable, unshakable love. It's not going to grow old. It's not going to die. It's not going to fade or perish. It's forever and always. And I'll say something that may be striking if you've never heard it. There will not be one person in hell that God didn't love. They just simply chose not to return the love. In October 1998, the National Geographic had an article entitled Perfume, the Essence of Illusion. One of the major companies in the industry stated perfume is a promise in a bottle. Anybody got any perfume or cologne on today? Because you want to smell, and that smell is to make a statement. Mm -hmm. Perfume speaks more to our vulnerabilities than our strength. We have the perfume to sell hope. Oh, they're sweet. Well, they smell good. Perfume comes from many different sources. It can come from the fragrant fields of lavender along the countrysides in France. It can come from the ducus petals of the Denmark rose. It can come from the Bulgaria's Valley of Flowers. There's vast fields around the world that merely are planted with flowers to grow them for the purpose of making perfume. Some even may think of the jasmine fields of India. It takes 2.5 million flowers to yield just one pound of jasmine concentrate. It takes 800 pounds of crushed roses to bring just one pound of concentrate. But, and I'll do the human thing, I'll turn this into dollars for us. Those pounds of concentrate turn into dollars. One rose concentrate can run at least $6,000 a pound and more, depending on what's going on in our economy right now. The jasmine of India, as much as $18,000 a pound. Ancient history bears out that the Assyrians perfumed their beards Nero literally washed in what was called a rose wine. And in the 18th century, there were many homes that were built, and the wood paneling that they started to use to cover the dirt was scented with oils to make sure the inside of the house had a certain smell, aura to be inviting. One of the most riveting things about the great perfumes of the world is the way that it is mixed. An industry term shifts the words to music. And the perfumer, the creator, the designer becomes a composer. He's called a composer because he's looking to put certain notes or scents, which are called notes, into the perfume or the cologne. The work is done almost as a three-part musical. The part of the perfume known as the top note, what you initially smell, it's called either the head or, and it, what it does is the first scent that you catch that comes off the skin. That's called the top note. It's a fanfare that vanishes literally. In fact, this morning I asked Sister, Sister Cross, I said, okay, who just sprayed all that? The whole house was permeated with a perfume. Yeah, my whole house was just, it was, that middle note or the heart, which is compounded of the heavier materials that are in the perfume, lasts for, for hours. So at about one o'clock, two o'clock, smell wherever you put it, that's that middle note. But here in America, we take free showers a little more frequency than, than what my research will bear out here. And there's what's called the base note or the dry down, and it can literally last for several days. We don't ever find that out here because we believe in showers and right and left guard. But the perfume in our text, Mary's ointment, has done this as well. 
or perfume, that, that, that ointment has resonated for centuries. That act of giving all that she had is in the room today. I want to quote that industry leader again. Perfume is a promise in a bottle. It speaks more to our vulnerabilities than our strengths because we're all selling hope. <laughs> With every sacrifice that is offered, there is a sense of hope that accompanies that sacrifice. It doesn't matter what it is when you've sacrificed, when you've given the essence. It's, it's hope that there's more. Isn't that what perfume does? There's more. There's more. The day probably started as a normal Saturday before Palm Sunday, and Jesus was with some of his closest friends and some of the disciples in the house of Simon the leper. The very event for the supper appears to have been motivated by the gratitude of Simon for Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. While they were silently eating the meal, a woman interrupts the entire Seen. Imagine yesterday, as you sat around your table, enjoying one another's company, Jesus at your table, and someone busts in the door, comes in, and breaks open this very valuable perfume, and pours it on Jesus. Your entire house would no longer smell of roast or ham or, or pies or whatever it is that you cooked, and we permeated by the smell of someone giving everything they had to Christ. She did this without uttering a word. She didn't come in there with fat and fair saying all this great stuff that she was just going to do. Sometimes actions just have to speak for you. We get a little weary of a whole lot of words, all talk and no action. Can I get an amen? She comes in and she breaks the bottle and she pours it upon Jesus and anoints him. Uh, one writer refers to this act as an oasis of sweetness in a desert of bitterness. To be sweet in sour circumstances. Maybe I need to say that again. To be a sweet soul in sour circumstances. To be godly in an ungodly world. To be prayerful in a world that's painful. I'm telling you, it just... Sometimes we're, we're focused on Mary's container when you and I need to realize the container is really us. What will come from your life and your breaking when you come before the Lord today? You have to understand in Mary's container with that alabaster box, was kind of referred to as a soft marble. And as you think about it, it is still talked about today. So the marble to Mary's box outlived the marble of the Roman Empire. What's done for the Lord, what's given to God, will outlast anything the world could ever build or do. It's a beautiful picture for us. And all the things of the world that we may accomplish or build or, 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 or lay claim fame to some kind of fame to, it's nothing compared to when we break and give ourselves to Jesus. Are you hearing me? Her worship is remembered by her constant place at his feet. In Luke 7, she's at the feet of Jesus, anointing him and wiping his feet with her hair. In, in, in Luke 10, she's at the feet of Jesus when Martha's preparing supper. And she's at the feet of Jesus in John 11 when Lazarus died. In all three of these times, Mary is specifically mentioned to have been in the presence of Jesus. And she's at his feet. There is a posture, there is a position that comes with real spiritual hunger and desire. Yesterday, I don't know what time it was, but Sister Crow walked into the room and she said, hey, do you want us to set out some chips and crackers so you can eat? And I'm like, oh, we're, 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 we're ready just to go ahead and eat the real food. Don't set it out. And I'm thankful that there was a witness in the spirit. As Charlie was like, yeah, let's just, you know, we're an hour away. Let's just, let's get to the real food. There's something about hunger. There's a position. There's there's a posture to it that, hey, I'm just, I'm just kind of ready to eat. I'm kind of ready. I'm hungry. Are you hearing me? True love is not proud. The Philippians tells us, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You have to understand, God 
manifested yeah. himself in the flesh. He robed himself. The Colossians 2 9 says he's yeah. in him dwell the fullness of the Godhead bodily, all that God could place inside the flesh, perfect flesh that had to die. He being found in fashion of a man, he humbled himself. Almighty God humbled himself, became a container to be broken. John 3, 16, for God so loved, there's that everlasting love that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. With genuine devotion has to be genuine commitment. Proverbs 16 and 19 says, better is it to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. And as she walked in and poured herself and her sacrifice upon Jesus, Something happened. She walked in in silence and did this act, but the silence was shattered by the murmur of complaint. I have to admit, I, I believe those that complained recognized the greatness of her act of worship. I believe they saw, and I, I don't remember who wrote it, I just remember some of that lyrics of some old boy singing about a girl he lost, singing, I wish I'd have thought of that, or I wish I'd have done that, or something of that nature. And I kind of wonder if they kind of sat there, oh, man, I'm sitting here with Jesus. Why didn't I do that? But instead, and sometimes in our nature, we battle that. We, we wish we'd have done what somebody else would have done so we could have got what they got. Because it's not that we have less to work with. We just maybe we're a little bit more self-indulgent than sacrificial. You look at a married couple, I wish we had the relationship they had. Well, it's not it's not available. You just have to do what they did. Well, I wish I had the job they had. Well, did you were you willing to go get the education they got? Well, I wish I could be a police officer. Are you ready to go run? Are you ready to, to do all the things that it takes? If you do you want do you want to be a doctor? There you just well, who doesn't? But you got to be willing to sacrifice and pour yourself yeah. into that. You have to understand there's nothing in life that just gets handed you for free. Right. Salvation costs something. It costs Jesus, robe himself and be broken. When she walked into that room, she duplicated what Jesus was doing for mankind. And she broke all that she had to get to that place. I understand what's happening here. I want to be a part of that. They had indignation among themselves, and they felt compelled to criticize because it makes us feel better. Isn't that our nature? I can cut it down. I won't feel bad that I didn't do it. I know y'all don't know nothing about that. You have to understand that the original context of this indicates that they ached with vexation. They murmured against her. The original sheds a greater light when it suggests that they growled at her and rebuked her vehemently. You have to understand the culture there. It ain't like it is here. She was put down. What are you doing in here? How dare you come in here? She stole her moment. They were hanging out with Jesus, but she was worshiping Jesus. A lot of people hanging out with Jesus. Everybody's got a bumper sticker. They got a cross they're wearing. They got whatever. They own a Bible. A lot of people hanging with Jesus, but she showed the difference because she came in worshiping Jesus. Oh, it's easy to criticize. Oh, you're, you're taking it too far. You don't have to do this. You know, you know what? You're right. You don't have to. But I didn't come to hang with Jesus. I came to worship. I came to bow down. I came in understanding what he's doing and done for me. It was an act of true devotion. Many want to dine with Jesus, but few want to be devoted to him. So they look and they say, why was this waste? Why would you give so much? Why would you, you know you put, you could have done with that? Oh, wait a minute, let's be how it is. I could give this, but you know what I could do with it? Well, I know they really need me down there at the church, but you know, I got other things to do. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. 
Preach it. Preach. And I get it. It makes a lot of sense. And we take everything to the bottom dollar. We look at our finances. We look at our time. And we calculate our week. And we realize, okay, I, I can give Jesus this, but I can't. Look, I, hey, I have to do the same thing, folks. I'm not talking about some apple pie in the sky, super spiritual, I walk around fluttering with angels around me. No, 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 I got to do the same thing. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? But here she is giving, and, and here's the people around. Why this waste? Let me explain to you. There's a difference between wasting it and giving it. Waste isn't worship, but giving is. You need to let that sink in because it wasn't waste, it was worship. You see, when you do it as under the Lord, I don't care what anybody says about it. You turn around and you get outside the norms and you start going beyond. People are like, oh, you don't need to do all that, but you don't understand. Someone's taking their worship to another yeah. level. Right. We've all heard it said. I said, if you want to do what they've done, you've got to go about and do what they did. I'll never forget one of my, and I'm not into sports much anymore, but Jerry Rice, he's the GOAT. I don't care about all the other controversies. Greatest receiver of all time. Can I get an amen? He said, I'm willing to do what others won't, so I can always do what others can't. It's, if, if that doesn't invade your psychological awareness of what you're going to do for God, if that doesn't come in, you can always say, well, I'm doing better than so-so. I'm doing better than so-so. And look around the room. It's a pretty small pool to be looking into comparing yourself. Why don't you step out? What did Jesus do? There's always cost involved in consecration. No matter how pure, no matter how holy or sacred the act may be, there will be those who question and accuse the person who goes beyond or who goes further. There will always be someone to criticize. Ah, you don't need to do that. You know, you're taking this religious church thing too far. You'll hear the comments, the criticism. Ah, I would, but I got this to do. I would. You're just a little emotional, more emotional than I am. I'm not that way. I'm not. I'm. It's kind of funny if your house is on fire. It's funny how you'd act about. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Funny how emotional you get when it's something you've given yourself to. Jesus notices those that go further. He always has. If you pay attention in the word of God, it says that he noticed the 10th leper who, when he healed them all, he came back and worshiped. The others were thankful. Oh, they got to hang with Jesus. One came back and worshiped. And it says that he, there was an interaction that he got that the others never had because he wanted to worship. He wanted to go further. He said, hey, I got my healing. I don't need Jesus no more. I got what I wanted out of him. God is keenly connected to the consecrated. That's why you see some people have developed. And prayer's hard. I, 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 we have prayer from the first to the third of every month. Amen. There's prayer here. Amen. It's supposed to be, a, if it was convenient, it wouldn't be a sacrifice. You come, you spend time in prayer. It's, an, it's supposed to be corporate prayers. We as a church unify because we want to make a real spiritual difference. It's not, a, it's, it's, it's not a punishment. If you think prayer is a punishment, you've missed it. It's a time to sacrifice and go beyond the norms of people that really don't have a walk with God. And we develop to get closer to God. Matthew tells us in chapter 5, verse 41, whoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Commitment and going further has always been an attribute that draws the attention of the Lord. He's made it very clear. And I know we, we make jokes over this one. You, you, they smite you on one cheek, give them the other. Some of us have found that's a bridge too far. There's always that presence of self-preservation. I feel it in here today. There's that struggle with gain and greed, and you're you're. Are you hearing me? 
that element of our nature that wants to steal that place of worship that would take us to those heavenly places. The things that will cause you to question worship because true worship has no limitations. Just ask a lady on Valentine's Day. Ain't no limitations, baby. <laughs> no, yeah, that's nice, but you know that white Lexus. That, oh, wait a minute, I want a Valentine's Day red one. There's no limitations on love, sweetheart. We're not going to Burger King. We're going to Fleming's. Am I getting some of you guys in trouble? It's funny, we got this great big marriage ceremony. We break it all out and deck the halls and everything's just beautiful and white and whatever color she chooses. But it's really a private intention. But we make a huge PDA out of very intimate private commitment. The devil hates PDAs. He doesn't want you to have uh, public displays of affection. It's the last thing he wants is a, a born-again apostolic believer to stand and worship God. I don't want anybody to see that. He wants you to go ahead and become stoic and, and what you call reverent or or, or, or pious and just stand there in all your holiness and, and self-indulgent, but he doesn't want that. He said, you know what, you keep your worship of God and you keep that in the church, right? That's what they say. You're out there with a PDA, get a room. Keep that in the church. But that's not biblical. The world needs Christians with the ability to, Throw some PDAs out there because by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love. One for, when we see one another, when we embrace one another, hey, it's good to see you. It's so good to see people out in the stores when we're, it's amazing to see y'all when, when we're going shopping at Costco or at Fry's and we see you. Okay, hey, how you doing, bro? And everybody's like, who are these folks? That's a PDA of Christianity. We love one another. We care about one another. We're there for one another. We're breaking that box of ointment because, hey, we're in a group of people that serve a great, wonderful God that became broken for you and I, and we, we duplicate and we replicate that. That makes sense? If your loved one that you hadn't seen for a while, you don't get a, if you sit there like, oh, what's up? I ain't seen you in 10 years. You hug. You hug. It's a PDA. Love and worship. It's not coerced. I do love you. This is easy for me. I can come in here and worship, and I can come in here and praise, and I, I don't care how long. It's funny how long we can interact with one another over the holidays with each other, but we come to church. You know, I, in fact, I asked Brother Lou as, as worship was going, worship was beautiful. Thank God, even after a holiday and all that, the music team, you guys are awesome. What a beautiful worship service. I are doing such an awesome job. And uh, I'm watching people walk forward with some PDAs, and I'm like, this is, this is great for God. This, this is what it's supposed to be. You ought to walk in here so thankful, no matter how long it's been that God delivered you. I wonder how these kids would feel when their mother walked in the room if I ignored her. How would you feel, Sister Crow and I weren't like talking or something? There's got to be some spontaneity. There's got to be, hey man, we loving. When you walk into the house of God, when you're walking down the street, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm in love with Jesus. Yes. Oh, I'm about to I'm about to nail something here. Because it's 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 like a fragrant perfume. It fills the room. It's amazing when you walk into this church. If you would come early like some of us, we're bumping fists and checking out each other's socks and giving a high five, and we're we're just we're brothers and sisters in here. It's a lot of fun. I'm wearing some socks Tia got me. I couldn't, I, I was like, yeah, you, I don't care what's going on. I got these as a gift. 
I'm going to wear these because we had to, had to school someone this morning who didn't understand that when you get a gift, man, you turn around and wear that because I'm thankful for what you gave. You sacrificed. You gave. You better believe a little girl that can't barely make it any money at all, doesn't have a car, and buying me socks. Loves her pastor, bought her pastor socks. You better believe I'm going to wear these bad boys. Best socks I ever owned. Because the meaning behind them. If that's that way with us, what do you think it is when you walk in here in the presence of God and you let him know, I know everything that you gave me, everything you've done for me. Oh, I walked into the room and you busted in the door and all my ugliness and all my sin and all my brokenness and you love me. He loves me. Mm. If you realize right now in the presence of God, he loves you with an everlasting love, you turn around and start giving some PDAs right back. I love you too. I'm thankful. You delivered me from drugs. You saved me from alcohol. I could have been dead. But oh, thank God I'm in love. It gets people's attention when you become demonstrative in your love for God. Nobody likes a sour smell. Nobody likes stagnant smell. It'll draw an eye real quick. And sadly, worship to some people. Yeah. Why didn't I think of that? I don't like them. But Jesus spoke up for her. Let her alone. Wow. You're here today. You worship God. Because I believe that voice still utters here. Let him alone. In fact, if, if these held their peace, uh, I hope you've read your Bible. I'm not going to give you the rest of that one. You should know it. These are the words that came from the mouth of Jesus. Let her alone. Oh. God, listen to me, is attracted to broken things. See, I know. See, the problem with some of us is if we think we've got it all together. It's those crushed grains of wheat that becomes the bread that sustains us. It's those bruised flowers that give up the substance to make the perfume. It's the, the crushed plants that gave, give their essence to create medicines. It's broken pitchers that helped Gideon defeat his foes. It, it was that depleted barrel and empty cruise of oil that the prophet of God was sustained. It was on the boards and broken pieces of a ship that Paul and his shipmates and companions were saved. And although no bone of the Lord was broken, it was his broken and bleeding body that brought salvation to the likes of you and I and the whole world. It was by the scattering of the early church and that the Gentiles, the likes of you and I, could even be here today. Thank God. God, the brokenness of all that brings a broken group of people to be made whole in the blood of Jesus. The broken parts or crushed areas of, of life is sometimes yield the greatest motives for service to God. You see, see, I, I love the fact when I love it when new people come to church and they have that unfettered love and that unfettered thing, but I don't care what anybody thinks because they're just so thankful. This is Verse that Jesus states will be a memorial unto her. Remember Cornelius? How many knows where Cornelius' story is found? Here's a better one. How many don't know? Acts chapter 10. It says in Acts chapter 10, verse 4, he's an Italian. He's a Gentile. She's not a Jew. He wasn't one of God's chosen. And it says that when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, thy prayers and thine alms are come up before a memorial before God. You really want to sit there silently? When you can build a memorial in heaven that God can't overlook, you realize your prayers and your giving is seen, and God, God, God's not blind to it. He's watching it. I wonder what would happen if some of us got back to that place of falling in love with Jesus and giving it all again. Not that, well, he saved me years ago, but he don't need to do anything for me today. Come on. Come on. That memorial 
is before the eyes of the Lord. You have to understand some memorials are for God and some memorials are for men. You have to find out what you're living for. There's ripers and givers. Those that give hilariously and those that give. The griper always hangs himself. If not with the rope, then with the selfish actions and words of disdain. The giver gives himself into immortality. One looks wise, one looks weird, but only one is the real worshiper. It doesn't make sense. Some of you wouldn't do, wouldn't do the things that I would do for Sister Crow. You don't understand, I'm the one in love. You, you wouldn't tolerate some of the things. You wouldn't buy, you wouldn't do. Some of you, you go home, shake your head, oh my God. Well, you got me shaking my head too. I'm not wasting my life. Are you wasting yours? When it's love, it's not waste. It's called giving. There's always imminent danger when the cost of love is when you attempt to calculate it. Worship can never be too much. Worship is never wasted. This precious perfume is never wasted. And in this situation, when you realize Judas had a perception that allowed him to understand the price of the perfume, but not the purpose of the perfume. Let me say it again. Judas struggled because he could count the price of the perfume, but not the purpose. When you come in here and it's all dollars and cents, and when you come to church and you calculate time and you got this guy, or... How dare we come to church and schedule something for one o'clock? What if we go long? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Think about that. Apply that to your life. Wait a minute. I'm spending Christmas with my kid. Don't be coming over on Christmas Day. Makes sense. But yet we're going to turn around on. No, we've done it noon. Most of the time we are, but what if we're not? You going to cut out of here? Judas had a perception that allowed him to understand the price of the perfume, but he didn't understand the purpose of the perfume. And that's the crux of this whole story. Be careful around those who calculate only the cost of a matter and are not sold out to a cause. Oh, let me say this. You have to understand something. People aren't going to understand your Christianity if they're only a part of it and not sold out to it. People won't understand. Why would you risk all that? Why would you stick your neck out? Because I'm committed to the cause. There's that old story about the breakfast. That ham breakfast, that bacon and egg breakfast. You see, the chicken and the pig are talking. You're involved, but I'm committed. Some of us walk around like chickens. Oh, you don't mind giving a few eggs. But I'm trying to save my bacon. Some of you got that. In Acts 8 and 18, and when Simon saw that through the laying on of hands, the apostles' hands that the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. What did Simon see? What did Simon see that he wanted to buy the power to give people the Holy Ghost? What did he see? Well, when, he, when, he, when, when the apostles laid hands on people and they got the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues, he yes. wanted that power. You're not going to give money for something that's just a feeling. Oh, yeah. These people who think, well, I got the Holy Ghost because it's a feeling, and I, I, got, I got a better attitude now. now that's not what it is. Nobody would pay a dime for that. Simon wanted what they had because something happened when they got the Holy Ghost. When they got the Holy Ghost, it was undeniable. When you get the Holy Ghost, it'll be undeniable. That's Scripture. You can argue and wipe fight with it all you want and say, that church don't preach it down, and that's fine. Go to that church. But this church right here, we still believe the Bible. It's that simple. I'm going to stay in the apostles' doctrine. If he says he's going to pour out the Spirit in the last days, he'll still be pouring out of his Spirit in the last days. If you don't have the Holy Ghost being in tongues, you don't have the Holy Ghost. The Bible says in John 3, 5, except the man is born of the water and of the Spirit. Jesus said that. Those aren't my words. Those are his. What he's saying is you can't have a casual relationship with Jesus. And so when they turned around and when Simon wanted to buy that, Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee because thou thought 
has thought that the gift of God, there's that gift, folks, may be purchased with money. True Christianity is the essence of giving. When King David was wanting to buy the threshing floor for an altar, he said, nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord of my God, that which cost me nothing. Listen, folks, I... You can't gain salvation by buying it. You only receive salvation by giving yourself to it. That's why Jesus said, many people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me. He can say he loves you, but it better put a ring on it. And then he better show up every night. Put the beans on the table. Put gas in the car. You only receive that by giving yourself to it. Salvation is not about performing functions of a checklist. You never hear the disciples use the term, I got saved. You never hear that. That's like, oh, I got married. Oh, no, I'm in love. Salvation is a product of that. You never hear the disciples ever hear, oh, when I got saved, because it's not a true term. Are you in heaven? You ain't saved. You have to live a walk of salvation and, and being full of the Holy Ghost that will lead and guide you into all truth. They refer to themselves as believers, not saved. Are you walking and living as a believer? Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's like saying, oh, I'm married, instead of living in a way that says, oh, I love my wife. Oh, I love my husband. Can't you tell? You can tell when someone's married. And you can tell when someone's shopping. Marriage and being a believer is not a checklist. It's a lifestyle. It's, I'm in love. Why, do you, why are you so faithful? Why do you give like that? Why do you act like that? Why do you worship like that? I'm in love? Amen. Judas had a twisted perception of spiritual things. And that was the ultimate reason why he failed. It says in John, why was not this ointment sold for three? He's, he, gets the, he wants to sell someone's worship given to the poor. This, this, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. Which is the word of God, John 12, 5 through 7. And he had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my bearing has she kept this. This whole concept dogged Judas' entire life because he would later understand the price of blood. Judas missed his moment of worship. That precious perfume that was poured out by a loving heart in worship, it wasn't wasted. It was given. Yes, I could do other things with my life. I'm not wasting it. I'm giving. Yes, I could be doing something out there. Yes, I could probably go back and work for Intel. I'm not wasting my life. I've given it. You see, you see, see, see let, me, let me help you. I'm not wasting my life. I've given it to my wife. I'm not wasting my life. I've given it to God. I'm not wasting it. I've given it. See, if people would you to understand, we're not wasting our life here. I've given it to the Lord. That's the honor. There's so many people. It's hard to honor mainstream Christianity today. Because it's so shallow. Yes. They're still drinking and smoking and carrying on and they're unfaithful and there's all this junk. And why would a world respect that? She did not waste the perfume on the dead but she allowed it to consume the living. You can waste your life on the things of this world, or you can gain eternal life by giving yourself to God. A rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, I've done everything in the law. I've done it. sacrifice 
They don't know you because they gave themselves to a cause. They didn't waste it. Mark 12 and 31. And the second is like this, nameless, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. He goes on to say, greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. This is why Jesus instituted the church. In Matthew, he says, then shall the righteous answer and say, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee to drink? Or when saw thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, verily I say unto you, in so much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. You see, you're not wasting your life by being a Christian and being all into the church. You're not wasting, you're giving it. To, Matthew says, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's why we gather and go give out blankets and give out meals and, and go and witness and love one another and do it because he's coming back for a church. What? A church full of people that realize I'm not wasting my life here. I've given it. I've given my life to this cause. There's no greater cause that I could give my life to. Some people are hoarders. Mm -hmm. They hoard everything in life. The greatest waste in life comes from hoarding things, keeping them from their proper use. I'm going to tell you here right now, if you got the best perfume, you wear that for your husband. Don't, don't wait, save that fine china. When your family comes over, use it. Why? You're just going to go and end up in a garage shell for somebody else because it looked pretty in your house and all it did was a look and didn't have any fun. The perfume would have been wasted if it hadn't been used. We must look at ourselves closely. And it seems easy to see others in their area of hoarding because it's definitely more difficult to see it in ourselves. Isn't it so easy? I can orchestrate everybody's life. I'm going to say it. You know you could. Right now, there's preachers in here going, man, I, I would preach this right now. I would say this right now. <laughs> Some of you, I mean, I wouldn't do that. I would be cooking like this for my husband. Why are you doing this? We, you have, we all, that's what we do. We all judge. People who say, don't judge. Do you drive down the street? Then you're judging. Did you look at your shoes before you put them on? You judged. Did you look at that meal before you ate it? Have you ever said anything bad? We all judge. The Bible says, judge ye a righteous judgment. Judgment's not wrong. You'd be kind of weird if you didn't. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Judgment's not wrong. Judge ye a righteous judgment. The Bible says judge not lest ye be judged. That's fine. If you're in the plan of salvation, you're living for God, and you give me, let's judge it by the word of God. Let's get, we should never get angry if we, have, have, if we don't understand a scripture. Let's, let's find out what it means. You, we don't define scripture. Scripture does. You have to take Matthew 28, 19 and reconcile it with Acts 2, 38. Those people who... Who's getting baptized in Matthew 28, 19? Nobody. It's not a baptismal service. You better know Scripture before you want to combat Scripture. You better know what it's saying. Who's getting baptized in Acts 2, 38? 3,000 people. How'd they get baptized? In Jesus' name. How'd they get the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues? How do we know? It says so. Galatians chapter 1 tells us if we are an angel preaching the other gospel, let them be a curse. Be careful if you're teaching something that's not true. Be careful. Hey, it ain't just nothing to come up here. Oh, it's fun. I like to get up there and preach. Boy, I'll tell you what. I, I shake every time. I get nervous. I don't sleep on Saturday nights. Take it very serious because there's people sitting here. If you want to be entertained, I'm not going to be able to do that. One thing, I'm not good looking and I can't sing and dance. But if you want to spend eternity in heaven, I promise you're going to get the word of God. I promise it'll be the truth. I promise it'll be the word of God. Scripture defines scripture. You and I don't. If you're confused, if, you're, if, you, if you don't have it according to the apostles' doctrine, you're in trouble. They baptize in Jesus' name. Paul said, I think I speak in tongues more than you all. What's he saying? He speaks in tongues. And this, this doctrine is to be preached to all generations. Is this a generation? Okay. I don't keep this to myself. I want to share it. Why? I'm giving myself to this thing. Hoarded up or unused perfume will never become a memorial glory before God. 
I have a friend of mine that goes yard, uh, yard sailing. They have stacks and stacks of unused, very expensive perfume because someone was saving it and they died and left it. This lady's alabaster box value was estimated at an entire year's worth of wage. I know it doesn't make sense to some of us. It might have been her life savings and it might have been the most valuable thing she had. But love and worship has its moments and when they pass by us, they're gone forever. In fact, today, why don't you call somebody and tell them you yes. love them? You can't in from the grave. You can't come back here after it's over and start worshiping God and living for God. In fact, you have to do it right now. You, in this service, you have to be able to leave this service today and go to heaven. No, no, no. Let me say it again. Whenever I preach or teach, and I got this mic, and it's me, I'm letting you know right now, I want you to be able to go to heaven from this service. You may not make it back here. You may get upside yourself. You may something mad. You some idiot may run a red light. You got to go to heaven from here. I don't have the whole room. I don't have the whole room. Oh, hallelujah. It is a privilege to give. They were sitting at a table dining with Jesus. They were casual. They were hanging with him. And someone came in. Jesus wanted this in the word for a reason. He wanted you to see what worship looked like, what giving looked like. He went, well, it's not waste, it's giving. Let's worship the Lord right now. Mary, Mary, Mary did something. Mary took her greatest gift and placed it in the hands of Jesus rather than saving it for the grave. Jesus didn't need a, mar a marble monument. He doesn't want a headstone. He longs and is looking for true worship today. I said he longs and is looking for true worship. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said, and thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said, Simon, seest thou this woman? I entered into your house. Let me put it. I've come into your life. I made myself available to you. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. You wouldn't clean the filthy. You wouldn't go to the obscure. You wouldn't go out of your way or sacrifice for those in need. Yeah. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. Do you realize he makes this statement to, in Judas's house? I mean, in Simon's house and Judas is there. Do you realize the... Do you realize what happened when Judas come to betray Jesus, what Jesus did? Simon and Judas never kissed Jesus, but when, Simon, when Judas came to betray him, Jesus kissed him. What a picture of God constantly loving us to only be betrayed. My head thou, with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. I want you to hear this. For she loved much. 
But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Have we forgotten? You know, God, I don't know, has God not had to forgive you of something major recently? I hope not. But have we forgotten that whether it's little or big, we can still be lost because of it? And just because it's little in our eyes doesn't mean he didn't pay the same price for it. Are we loving little? Have we slipped on the banana peel of self-righteousness because we've learned to live right? Because we got some things fixed in our life? <laughs> and we've also learned to love little? Is God not worthy of our total devotion? There's an old custom to, of honor would cause a host when you had company to go to the seat of the guest and take the glass that he was drinking from and break it at the end of a meal. It was done for the reason of letting them know that no lesser hand would ever touch the glass again. It was to give honor and to say, you are the most important. Mark 14 says, and Jesus said, let her alone while I trouble ye her. She hath wrought a good work on me. That Greek translates there is agathos, which describes a thing that is morally good. The other one is kalos, which describes a thing which is not only good, but lovely, beautiful, and primarily valuable, good, and virtuous. A thing may be agathos, good, yet it can be hard, stern, austere, and even unattractive. Justice, ethic standards fall in that category. They're good and they're necessary, but they become rigid, unmerciful and hurtful. You can be so caught up in your standards. But Kalos, it is beautiful and lovely, and it has an appeal to it, and that is exactly what Mary did. She, she, love does not do only good things, but love does beautiful things in our longevity of living for God. Have we become more rigid and less loving? Have we become more performance and less worshipful? In all honesty, when I look, and I never stop doing it, people, those of you that come forward, keep doing it, please. Yes. I implore the rest of you to realize how valuable it would be to find that place of when I come here, I've come to worship the Lord. I'm not a robot. I'm a worshiper. I'm not here to perform a function. I'm here to let God know I love you. I'm thankful. It may have been a long time since you dug me from that pit, but I'm glad you dug me from that pit. If love is true, there will always be some extravagance about it. If, if love can see, there will be a sense of recklessness that comes with it. If, if love is alive, there will be something about it that will not be calculated. Oh, you want that right now? And you lay the coat down and she can walk across that puddle. Or you go beyond and above and you do those things. And you, you stand up in honor of a cause that you, it's not wasting, it's giving. One of the greatest tragedies of life is when we, no, to do something great, and we hesitate. Are you hearing me? Oh, I wish I had done that. Oh, I wish I, I became calculated instead of carefree with that. I, I became cheap instead of giving. And it occurs and even starts getting in the simplest things and the impulse to send a letter of thanks, and we, ah, we let it go, or the impulse to tell someone how much we really care about them, and, ah, they know, or the impulse to go out above yourself and give a sacrificial gift because you just don't want to be ordinary and you want them to know that they're special. And we stop short of where we could go. I wonder how many of us became calculated with God and stopped short of where we could have gone. There's some song lyrics. Most of you will know them, and I'm about to bring this to a close. It stops short. Because it's a thought that counts, right, folks? 
No. Actions speak louder than words. The songs go, maybe I didn't love you quite as often as I could have. And maybe I didn't treat you quite as good as I should have. If I made you feel second best, girl, I'm sorry I was blind. You were always on my mind. You were always on my mind. And maybe I didn't hold you all those lonely, lonely times. And I guess I never told you I'm so happy that you're mine. Little things I should have said and done. I just never took the time. You were always on my mind. You were always on my mind. Tell me, tell me that your sweet love hasn't died. Give me, give me one more chance to keep you satisfied. I'll keep you satisfied. Hey, 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 are you hearing me? Hey, Lord. So many times I thought about it. Hey, Lord, I really wanted to worship today, but I just saw, you know, my leg. Or oh God, I just, so many other things. I, would just, I don't want any of us to have to be able to sing that stupid song or those words standing before. I, I meant to. I, it entered my mind. But the problem is we got to get it just from standing on my and get it into our heart. Mm. The last line of that song is to tell. Because now he wants to meet her needs now. But before, he was really just simply selfish. Jesus called this out, and he said in Matthew 15 and 8, this people draweth nigh to me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart. Just stand. You can never waste your perfume for the occasion that it was meant to be given to. In service, and I don't mean to embarrass anybody, but I was standing at the back of the church this morning knowing I was going to be talking about this. And I saw this amazing couple have their arms around each other in this church. And I, I thank God. Because you don't understand when you minister. I, I appreciate getting ministered to. I appreciate watching... Sister Carlo, you're, I, I appreciate you being so transparent and knowing you're so rough around the edges, but isn't it beautiful when a lady that's come through what she's come through can lift up her hands and walk to the front of, of a church? Isn't it beautiful when some broken people can come in here and pour themselves out to the King of Kings and the Lord will realize that's what the church is for? I never want the thing of what church is supposed to be to be lost in all the functions and the things that I'm required to do as a pastor. I want to be one to let you know that it's still worth it to come to an altar and to pour yourself out and to give yourself. And I want to say, never get to the place where you're too lofty to love or too great to give or you have nothing to offer there's an altar here and a God waiting for those that will get it past their mind and their mouth and let it become the deed it's not wasting it's giving to Mary Jesus was all the world to her. Anything else would be a lesser use. If you ever gave, there's no greater giving than to God. Why do so many insist on keeping their treasures, keeping their love and affections, their alabaster boxes, so to speak, and their gifts away to the highest use of the master? We're warned, lay not up your treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. Was it really reckless? Was it an extravagance of an impulse? 
were demonstrative of this woman. Was it a waste? Jesus said she did what she could. Jesus recognized the actions, the thoughts and the heart produced an action. Our actions will always perform a ministry beyond our immediate intentions. I came to worship the Lord today. We, we're on the threshold of a new year. We're, we're, we're standing on the threshold of a time change. And when you live your life, that is crucial to understand that, that, that it, I want to turn that if I could and I would into I can and I will. I want to get beyond the the measured thinking and calculating to have a zeal for God to maybe even have the impetuousness of a Peter the persistence of a Paul that will energize my faith and energize my prayers that not only in my service to God I would be the best pastor and Christian that I would be a, a better husband a, a better son, a better brother I want an insatiable desire for God because when I give my all for God I'm better in every other area that my holiness would improve that, 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 that the cause that we live for that we live for God like there's no tomorrow. I, oh, if we could get that this morning, if someone would come forward and get that, that I just want to live for God. Like, like I want to quit calculating like there's tomorrow. I, I want to make sure my loved one knows I love them today and God knows I love them today. I'm not saving my best song for next week. I'll sing it now. I'm not saving for tomorrow. I'm giving I today. I didn't waste it by giving it today. Heart.